just in case I forget at the end, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, B&H, uh, where I've spent a lot of my money. <laughs> and uh, I thought if I did this, maybe I'll get a discount, but David assured me that wasn't possible. So, uh, so. Um, I was trying to make a segue from the wedding uh, photography in, into kind of what I do. And 1971, uh, I was staying in a small apartment in Manhattan Beach where I'd I'd, I'd only been in the States for a year. And uh, my landlord said, uh, you're a photographer. I said, I am. He said, would you like to do my wedding? I said, sure. He said, have you done any weddings before? I said, no, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, so uh, he said, I'll give you two months free rent if you photograph my wedding. So that was, you know, I was excited about this because it was two months free rent. And uh, I went ahead and prepared for it as best I could. I was on my own just with a camera. I didn't have any assistance at that time. And uh, I then thought that I did a pretty damn good job on the day. I, I kind of covered everything uh, from early morning until late in the evening. And uh, then I took all of the pictures that I did. And he said he was going to be on honeymoon for a couple of weeks. And uh, I, I then spent so many hours, you've got no idea, reframing the pictures, redoing the pictures. Uh, making a book for him, uh, making a box of prints, and I found a wooden box for his prints, so uh, I, I put them all beautifully in that. I framed every single image, and uh, I put everything in a large bag, and then I, three weeks later I went to see him, and uh, he looked a bit surprised when he saw me, and uh, I said, well, I have all of your pictures here. And uh, he, he, said, he said, I don't really need them, he said, because I'm already divorced. So, uh, the, uh, the next one I did <laughs> was 16 years later, uh, where I'd, I, I did the royal wedding in 86. So it was a, a, a bigger affair, to say the least. And uh, for sure, that, that event shortened my life, that's for sure. And there's at least one hour of stories about what happened in Buckingham Palace and, and so on. Now, unfortunately, this wedding also ended in divorce. So, uh, with Andrew and Fergie. And uh, so, I, I would just, to conclude the wedding stories, um, I, I would not recommend that you book me to do your wedding. <laughs> so, anyway, that's my segue into the, <laughs> into, <laughs> into what I do. Um, I'm going to, I've been told to move this along quickly and not start telling too many stories, but uh, um, I basically, you know, worked everywhere. My first job after school was missile research, where I was on a small early computer plotting courses of missiles going from Britain to Russia. And then after doing that for a year, I then went uh, back up to Scotland where I was born. and. I uh, was working in a chocolate factory, and I went to night school. And I actually got admission to Edinburgh University to study mathematics. And I, for some reason, I took art classes uh, for two nights a week. And uh, I just loved it. And I ended up getting into Dundee University, the art college there, the Duncan and Jordanston. And I spent two years doing general art. And then um, I really kind of fell in love with, with graphic design. And for the next two years, I specialized in graphic design. And fortunately for me, there was a wonderful new department set up, the photography department. And you were able, as a craft subject, to study photography and graphic design. So I qualified. Uh, I got a degree in graphic design. And uh, then I was very fortunate. I won a scholarship from IBM to tour the States. So I got my first taste of the States. Uh, in, uh, th that would be uh, 1966. Uh, and at the same time, I got into the Royal College of Art uh, Film School. So when you look at a lot of work that I've done, you can quite easily, because sometimes people are confused by 
what I do because I, I, I touch so many different genres. Uh, but when you look at it, you can clearly see film and you can clearly see graphics and sometimes a combination of the two, that you see graphics and also uh, film kind of combined together. Um, when I first arrived in the States, my, uh, I, my wife got a teaching job in California and I moved to California. And I kind of got started quite quickly. And uh, I, I'll try and tell the story quite quickly because uh, you can see what's possible. I went in to see the, the head of Max Factor and he was a guy called Jim Roth, and he said, well, you've got lots of pictures here, but you don't have any beauty shots, and it was Max Factor. So, and I said, well, the, you know, basically the, the pictures are arriving soon. You know, of course, because you know, I'd been at film school. You know, was, uh, yeah. And um, so he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, and he was the only contact I had in, in the whole of the States was this guy that somebody knew him and introduced me to him. And... He said, I'll, I'll book you know, a model for you for an hour. And we've got, some, we've got a closet here full of, full of clothes you know, that you can borrow. And you can pick a model. And I, that's what I did. I went to an agency and I, I saw a lot of girls and picked one that I thought was very pretty. And I then met her and said, any chance you could stay the whole day with me? And you know, basically, uh, I'll give you the shots, the extra shots, like a testing session, you know? So I, I had her turn up at seven in the morning and I shot from seven in the morning on my own. I had no assistance or anything, of course. And from seven in the morning until eight in the evening, it was summertime, so I could shoot late. And uh, she said that she had a, a male model friend uh, who was a great guy. He, he came along and I photographed them individually, together, and so on. So I took every bit of money that I had, and, uh, which was not a lot, and uh, put it into the film and processing. And of course, I was just praying that I would get that money back. So uh, two days later, I went in and had a meeting with this guy, and, and I, I laid down 85 rolls of film. So he said, oh my god, he said, you did this in an hour? And, uh, <laughs> So I said, I said, no, I, I talked to girl into staying all day. She'll just bill you for an hour. And um, he had a look at them, and he didn't say much. And uh, he picked up a few rolls, and he said, have a seat. He said, I'll, I'll be back. And um, he went away and came back, and he said, uh, I have good news for you. He said, I just showed this to everybody, and uh, they're going to uh, pick up uh, four shots of this for advertising. And uh, I thought, that's good. And he then went away again. He came back. He said, actually, somebody else, the international division, is going to pick up a shot as well. So we're going to take five shots. And uh, I thought, that's a good sign, because I'll get my money back for the film. And um, he said, I'll give you a PO. I had no idea what a PO was, a uh, purchase order. And uh, so I kind of got into the elevator, ripped it up to see how much money I was getting. And uh, I thought, wow, that's five shots, $150 a, a shot. And uh, I, I said, that's pretty good. What's that? $750. And, uh, and plus to pay for the expenses. So I was really happy. So I went home and I, my wife borrowed a typewriter and I said, we have to type out a bill. And we typed out the bill. And uh, she looked at it and said, you know, you have to remember we were from Europe. So she said, I don't think it's $150 a shot. She said, it's $1,500 a shot. <laughs> and I said, OK, obviously that's a mistake. <laughs> that, that, that's absolutely a mistake. And um, I said, OK, now, if we bill for this amount of money, we're going to be deported. So there's no, no mis absolutely, this is, we can't do it. So uh, I thought, well, I've got another meeting because the guy wants to see me again about another shooting. And uh, so I'd, I'll ask him, sort of thing. So I, when I had the meeting with this guy again, Jim Roth, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, I just wanted to speak to you about how much 
you know, how much money I'm, I'm getting for this. And then he looked at me, he said, well, look, he said, uh, $1,500 is all I can pay right now per shot. And he said, uh, next time I'll get you more. <laughs> so, um, at this time, my wife's salary was like $2,000 or something a year, you know, so to suddenly get $7,500 for a day was just, I thought, not only do I like photography, but I like America at the same time. <laughs> um, so that was really the beginning, and uh, to be quite honest, I didn't really look back, but I realized early on how little I knew, you know? And uh, I'm gonna show you a, uh, a video uh, now. Unfortunately, I tried to get my new video ready for it. It just wasn't right. It wasn't right. But I'll show you the a video that probably a few of you have seen before, and uh, and then I'm going to show you some new work. What I'm working on now, so you you can kind of see the connection from the old work to the new work, and uh, I'll give you some backgrounds. And uh, I have a. It's always difficult with an audience like this of photographers because I think there are photographers who have been photographers for quite a long time, and uh, I think there are there are brand new photographers here. So you try and make the talk work across a, a broad spectrum of things, you know. So I can I have a few tips, but probably the older photographers don't need any tips, you know. Um, so I think that we can uh, we can roll this video. It's about eight minutes. But it gets through a lot of work, you know, so you can. Uh...
So, um, as you can see from the video, I never really settled down completely. Uh, I, I stayed with landscapes and still lifes and uh, all kinds of different things. I, I returned to some of my roots with graphic design and uh, doing different things. Now, everything that you saw there was actually shot on film. So the whole, that whole video is film. And uh, when the digital revolution happened, I actually, it, it didn't really affect me that much. Uh, there are some things that I prefer film for, and uh, I think the di new digital cameras are amazing, incredible things. Everybody, of course, shoots digital now for the most part, a few diehards. And uh, the beauty is you can shoot film if you want, you can shoot digital if you want. Uh, but to me, you, you raise the camera to your eye and you see a rectangle. And how good a photographer you are is what you put in the rectangle. And it's not the equipment. I would view preparation for a shoot to be 5% the equipment and 95% what the hell are you going to shoot? That really should be your, your driving force. And a lot of times, unfortunately, with photographers, young photographers that I've spoken to, their preparation sometimes is 95% to make sure that they've got all their equipment. So I'm not saying that the 5% isn't important. Of course it's important, but it's a given. I think if you leave on holiday with your car, you make sure that your car's got gas in it. So, I mean, you, it's just a given. You, your equipment should be working 
even if you spend two hours getting your equipment ready, but then spend six hours figuring out what the hell you're going to do. And uh, I found that over the years that it helped me when I started to write down some things about what I was going to do. Um, how am I going to approach it stylistically? Um, I, am I in a studio? Am I on location? Uh, what, am, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, recently I, was, I had a museum show in Stockholm and uh, there was a photographer from a magazine there came to take a picture of me. So uh, that, that happens quite a lot. And uh, so when he arrived at two and I told him, I said, I don't know if I, when I can do it, but I'll definitely give you time between two o'clock and five o'clock. So uh, he basically uh, uh, waited for me while I hung a show, you know, hung most of the show. And then at like 4 o'clock, 4.15, I said, okay, I'm ready for you. I said, um, wh wh what do you want? You, you know, he's the photographer, so where, where do you want me to be? He said, well, I'm not actually sure yet. <laughs> now, I mean, this is just unacceptable. <laughs> that he watched me hang a show of my work for two hours. And then he didn't have an idea about where he was going to go and shoot. Now, sometimes you get a younger photographer who's nervous photographing an older photographer who's been around. Uh, but you, you still have to have a preparation. You have to prepare what, what you're going to do. What, what is your concept? What's your idea? What's your philosophy of lighting, you know? Um, sometimes, just nowadays, sometimes photographers are lazy with lighting. I find uh, they put up a soft box and it stays there. And uh, I often am shooting in rental studios now, and you walk by a lot of studios and, you know, maybe a three-day shooting, and you walk by the same, and the, the light's in the same position for three days. The photographer never moves the light because it's just a big soft box, and he feels comfortable with it, and the pictures look okay. But uh, it, it's a great shame because uh, I had felt early on that, that one thing, and a lot of people look at my work and say, God, you're so technical. Uh, and, and this is not, people like my assistants that normally just always laugh at that because uh, I, I find the technical aspect of photography a pain in the neck. And, uh, but it, it's, it, it's like learning to drive a car. You, you should be able, you, you have to conquer it. I mean, you know, when you first get in a car, it's impossible. You think I'll never do it, I'll kill myself or somebody else. Uh, and, but then after a week, you feel a little bit better. After six months, you feel pretty confident. And then once you've been driving for years, you, you feel pretty good about getting in the car and going somewhere. In fact, you do everything in a good way automatically. So a little bit, I, I think, as a photographer, that's what you should be doing. You know, you, you should be comfortable with the equipment. And as I said, yet learn to drive the car, learn to drive the camera, uh, but where are you gonna take it? Who are you as, as a photographer? What, who, who are your inspirations? You know, who, who are the people that, that you love. Lots of time people ask me, I mean, who are my favorite photographers? And I have dozens and dozens and dozens of my favorite photographers. I, I, I love old school, I love new school. I love some of the new young photographers. I think that a lot of them are doing very interesting work. Um, and I have to say that during, just to finish this part of it, that uh, I have to say that the thing that really impressed me, uh, you know, with the digital revolution was really the computer. I, I, I thought the computer was just an outrageous device. And uh, although I'm still in a dark room doing silver prints, um, I can also make large format negatives in, in a digital system uh, where I, I, I can affect you know, a 20 by 24 inch negative and do contact prints onto silver. So I'm doing pigment printings, you know, every, everything from chromogenics um, and using every possible thing that's available today. And uh, you have to stay aware of what's going on with all of that. It's, it's a, it's a, uh, you, you shouldn't not be aware of what's going on, but at the same time, what are you gonna put in that rectangle? That's really the, the, the driving force. And it seems like the obvious thing, but, and that silly little story about the photographer that wasn't prepared, to, what, what was he gonna do with me, uh, is, is really not a bad example uh, for, for what you should really be, you know, the, your, your preparation and so on. So, um, this is a, a, a series of, of pictures here that uh, I, I worked for kind of about a year on using the computer as a device and uh, working with uh, 
handmade inks that, that I made. So I was able to go back to my roots, uh, to, to graphics, and uh, you know, begin to integrate um, inks that I made in the studio and scanned, and then integrated them into uh, pho photographic images. And the idea was, my feeling is that you still need a strong image. So it wasn't like I'm trying to cover things up. Sometimes photographers cover up a rather weak image by putting a very nice decorative kind of raw Polaroid border around it or a texture or they make the picture extra grainy. They're always trying to solve the, the idea of how do, how do I make this more artistic, more, and so on. So I, I, maybe I fall a little bit into that category, uh, but the one thing I'm, I was not forgetting is how the, you know, there should be power and strength in, in the image. So we can go to another shot here. Um, this is also inked. Uh, this is a, a very straightforward uh, portrait of a guy in raw sunlight. The original was done on film and then the inks were worked on later. Um, and some of these shots, one thing you would realize with that video, some of the shots in the, in the video go back a long way. You saw the Chinese shots, that goes back to the 70s. So these shots are 40 years old, you know. Uh, but you should be able to see in all shots a connection of what was my driving force and how graphics played in it and how film played in it and how research for a shot played into it. And you can see what I was doing here. So what I'm doing here is not preparing something for a magazine, and I would say that 99% of what you saw on the, the screen there uh, from the video was all for somebody. You know. Now, sometimes it was a commissioned book on Las Vegas or a commissioned book on Morocco, and I had a lot of freedom, but it was still commissioned by somebody. A lot of it was Italian Vogue, uh, French Vogue, um, uh, English Vogue, German Vogue, and so on. So I worked for all these, all these magazines. I worked also a lot for... Uh, a rolling stone, you know. Uh, so we can go to another shot. I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, when I was in on the island of Skye doing a six-week project on landscapes, I shot a bunch of uh, textural landscapes that were really to be incorporated later with a, a series of nudes, uh, which uh, unfortunately with uh, which I respect, of course, uh, B&H, I couldn't show a lot of these. Uh, but I, I respect that. So when I did the, the landscapes in Scotland, um, I, I planned the landscape. So since I'm talking about preparation and, uh, and how did I prepare to say do the landscapes. Now what I did with the landscapes, I, a lot of times landscape photographers, quite rightly at sometimes, they, they rely on the landscape itself to deliver the punch. You know, and uh, I was aware of that. In other words, if you go to Iceland, people love going to Iceland to take pictures because you don't have to. You don't have to do a lot of work. It's right in front of you. You know, the, you go and photograph a geyser in, in the winter time, and all that steam comes out of the ground, and you, you can you can get a powerful a powerful image. Uh, so my preparation for this was um, I had with me a book of Dega landscapes, the the uh, post impressionist, and. Um, I was always impressed by how he could just do a, a pastel drawing of just a rock, you know, the kind of thing that everybody would just walk by as a photographer. It's not, impor it's not important enough. Uh, but I found it very inspiring. And then the second, the second thing, I kind of had in my mind kind of Lord of the Rings and kind of Game of Thrones as, a, as an emotional. I was try trying to put something strange or find strange things that were unusual, that were kind of natural landscapes, but at the same time, that there was something unusual about them. And uh, of course, I took a lot of pictures. I, I had a very good crew with me. Um, there was a very, there was a funny blog that I actually loved from somebody who did a blog that had hundreds of replies. And the, there was a BBC documentary that you can find, like what do artists do every day? And you can find a documentary on me doing this project. The BBC did it. They did a very nice job on it. Um, but the response from photographers was, uh, how do you become so famous that your assistants do everything? <laughs> and the interesting thing was for me, there was like 180 replies right away to it. And uh, I, I, of course, a lot of young photographers said, it's just me and, a, and, and an old sandwich. 
you know, that when I go shooting, that's all I have is, is, a, is an old sandwich, you know. And, uh, of course, you see me there with three assistants around me. Now, uh, it took 180 replies for some photographer to actually say, uh, actually, I use assistants too, and I find it makes me more efficient. You know, and uh, of course that's why you use assistance. But I, I just uh, I, I thought it was amusing to me that it took 180 replies before somebody said it's quite normal to use assistance because it enables you to be quicker and f and faster, and you can move from one location to another location. And of course, I have to say I, I did pick all of the shots. None, none of the assistants were picking the shots. They wouldn't they wouldn't dare, you know, <laughs> to do that. Uh, but they're fabulous fabulous assistants. Um, so a, a lot of things that I shot, I, I shot quite a lot from inside the car. This was one that was done from inside the car, on the, you know, through the windshield of the car, um, which was kind of awkward because it wasn't such a big car. And it was always raining, so it was always water kind of coming down the front of the car. So the idea with these was my attempt, whether I was successful, other people have to decide, was to put something emotionally into sometimes simple images, because it's a, it's a beautiful island, this island off the coast of Scotland, you know, sky. And uh, I deliberately went, I chose to go in October, November, when the weather's horrendous. And uh, that's, of course, what you want. You want, for landscape, for me personally, my choice is that what you want is bad weather. Uh, you, don't, you don't want a nice sunny day with fluffy clouds. I was terrified that my pictures looked like postcards. Um, and one kind of small thing I found there, and I, I don't have a large selection of them, um, I, I found it incredibly beautiful, the surface of water, and how the wind just changed the light on the surface of the water. And it, it, I actually spent three days just photographing water, the surface of water. I, I, I think most photographers do landscape, they're fascinated by that. But uh, just for some reason, I just, I found it just magical. So here was a case where, for sure, landscapes were, the, what was in front of me was helping me. Um, but it, it just was, an, it was a, a simple, flat surface that was just always changing. And the wind was never the same, of course. And, uh, uh, and I, I, I personally was very happy with the shots that I got from that. Um, this is something completely different. This is straightforward portraiture. It uh, was done for a Japanese Vogue and uh, was a series of portraits. And the driving force in the preparation here, I was a big fan of the photographer Disfarmer and uh, how sometimes simple his pictures were. Um, he was that Arkansas, I believe Arkansas photographer um, that died. Uh, nobody knew who the hell he was. And, uh, but his, his pictures were simply magical. They were dust bowl pictures, 30s and 40s and very early 50s of just the townspeople. And there was something really honest about the, the pictures. They were not forced or anything like that. So sometimes you, you're inspired by someone like that and it's not that necessarily your picture ends up. I'm actually not a very good copier. I, I've a few times set out to copy a picture, and, uh, and, and I somehow get lost, and I end up doing something else. Uh, but I find the inspiration very, very nice. I find that when you, you, know, when you, you find something that inspires you, there's something about that, that uh, to spend your evenings before a shooting looking through lots of work of other photographers. It's not necessarily that you're looking to copy a shot or you say, well, I don't like, somebody said to me, I don't like looking at other photographers' work because it, it, it puts me in the wrong direction. I said, well, you know, you should be strong enough and powerful enough to, to get over that, you know, and make your own statement. Uh, this is from the same shooting. And uh, it was a very, uh, just to, to give you a background on that, in a shooting like this, you're actually expected to do quite a lot of, uh, quite, a, quite, quite a, a, an amount of pictures in the day. And on a day like this, there would be uh, anywhere between 32 or 38 pictures. Um, and uh, I would like to think that if, if that's what this talk was about, I, I could show you the whole shooting and I would be happy with them. 
So uh, it's one advantage when you've been a photographer for a long time that, and you're prepared for the shooting and you know what you're going to, how you're going to approach the shooting, you can cover a lot of territory. And especially if you have, as I've said before now, good assistants around you, if you have superb hair and makeup people, and of course a brilliant stylist, editor. Uh, these people in fashion are very, very important. Uh, with it, you're, you're an important person at the shooting because you're the photographer, but uh, you, you, need, you need these people around you. So that's sometimes what's quite difficult for someone that's interested in doing fashion. If they're competing with somebody like me, um, they have the advantage of youth and vibrancy and, and maybe originality from which is good, but then it's very difficult when you, because I'm using the best models, the best hair, the best makeup, and working for really good, good editors, you know. Uh, and and that's, they make a big contribution to what you do. That's, that's different to say the landscapes where I, you're on your own, there's nobody else there. Uh, this was a project that I did uh, for Cotton Made in Africa and the Bill Gates Foundation, uh, where I went to Benin and I did a lot of reportage there. I did a lot of portraiture there. Um, you know, this was two sisters. Uh, and this was uh, a, an event in the middle of Benin, which is, you know, it's always quite shocking when, when you go to these countries and you get out of the, the, the main city that suddenly you realize that everybody, of course, is still living in a very basic, almost poverty-struck way, you know. Uh, but... Uh, the, the nice thing was I, I photographed uh, at a festival there, and uh, the, they dressed up in their very best, Sunday best, as it were, clothes, and so therefore they were very good to, to photograph, you know. Um, this was a, a girl that I, 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 so I was driving along, I, I, I saw her on her way to this festival, and uh, and we stopped and I, and I just asked her if she would sit in front of the camera for five minutes to, to do this portrait. And a lot of the people there are incredibly beautiful and she was certainly just a, a real beauty, you know? Uh, almost like a, you might say a fashion model, you know? Uh, and uh, it, it's, this personally is not one of my favorite shots. Uh, we, we usually include it just because of the sheer beauty of the girl, you know? Uh, but uh, it, it, she looks a little bit too close to, to fashion for me, you know, uh, as, a, as, a, as a beautiful model, you know. I, I, I prefer some of the faces that are more interesting, more unusual, you know. Uh, when I was there, I did in a place called Wida, which is where a, a very interesting place where they, uh, they actually, where voodoo came from. It's where voodoo spread from there to the Caribbean, to Brazil, and so on. And uh, this place is full of magic, you know, uh, full of fetishes, markets that sold dogs' heads and that you put under your bed for fertility. And, uh, it, and uh, so it was a very kind of strange place, primitive, but you, you definitely felt something there. And the side streets of this old colonial kind of Portuguese looking place, you know, uh, that you could, you could just get kind of wonderful, strange pictures, you know. And so I did a lot of these at night time, you know. A lot of the, the shooting there was, was just massive 12, 14 hour days, you know. I mean, when I do a trip like this, you give up the time to do it and therefore you do your, your best. This is, we actually arrived at this beach. The hotel was just along from the beach. This is Wida still. And, uh, and, and I actually saw this shot from the car and there was just a, a child. He, he was looking out to sea like that and it, as we stopped, he was going to come across and speak to us, or come and look at us. And uh, I, I asked him just to wait there because I saw that shot. It was, uh, we arrived there just in the evening, so you, you, can, uh, you can see just what's possible. Now this is, uh, this is earlier, this is, was done in 97, and uh, was a book commissioned by the King of Morocco uh, on the country of Morocco. And uh, I basically approached this and I did everything from portraiture to landscapes, uh, still lifes. I photographed the king himself and, and so on. So there was, I, I did a lot of different things to make the book interesting. And it was a beautifully reproduced book done on a 10 color press. And uh, it was a, uh, I, I was lucky enough to do the, the layout for the book and I worked with a very good typographer. 
and uh, the book was very nice. Um, this is kind of a, a, a funny picture because this child just, I wanted a, the child to look at the camera and the child just would not look at my camera. And uh, the, the, the grandmother came by and, and, and basically said to us, she in the mountains and she said, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get, so it was a little girl. She said, I'll get her to look at the camera. So she <laughs> held her head there, you can see. But then just as I hit the shutter, the child looked away. Still didn't, still didn't. Uh, but of course, it made a good shot. This was just, the, that's the Atlas Mountains at the back there. Um, and uh, th that's in, uh, in Tarudant, uh, a very fertile valley just south of Marrakesh. Um, I know Morocco very well. I have a house there. And... Uh, I, I've been there for 22 years, so it's a, it, it's, it's a wonderful place, very kind of magical. Uh, this was a shot that was actually not done for the book. It actually, I, don't, I can't remember if we used it in the book, but it was in Cyclops, my first book. And uh, this was, uh, she's actually, to, to make it work for the magazine, I did this shot, it was Italian Vogue, and it was done in Marrakesh. And uh, she was a flower seller. She was selling roses. And uh, I just took a few petals, put them in her hand. And to make it work for the magazine, so I knew they would use it, uh, she, she put on a robe that was a Saint Laurent robe, you know, and that, that gave me the credit. And so therefore, it was a shot that ended up being right in the middle of the story. So of course, it was a, it, that, that was a way of getting it into a magazine as opposed to just doing it for yourself, you know. Uh, I had a kind of, interesting experience with, with Kate Moss. Um, I only photographed her once, one day. And the day started at seven in the morning and I shot until 9.30 at night. So she was basically 14, 15 hours with me. And uh, I did an amazing amount of pictures with her. I think there was a total of about 45 pictures, uh, separate situations with her. And uh, she never complained. And uh, right as I did the last shot, she came up to me and, and, and I said, thank you for working so hard. You never complained. And, and she said, well, she said, today was my 19th birthday. So she, she worked that 14 hour day sort of thing and uh, never, never complained. Um, obviously all of this was shot on film and this is a solar eye shot. Uh, so it's a bit, a bit like an homage to Man Ray, of course, with, with uh, solarization. So it was kind of a strange thing that I only ever worked for her with that one day, but there was just endless shots. This was another one that was done that day. And, uh, but I knew she was coming in, and she was up and coming at that time, and I, I had prepared a lot. So I, I knew exactly where I was going, what I was going to do with color, the lights, the filters, and everything like that. So I was pretty prepared. I'd sat up the night before for about two or three hours preparing. And therefore, the day was totally productive. And all of these shots have gone on to make editions that have sold out. They're, they're finished. So it, was a, it ended up being a very profitable day as well as a creatively a nice day, you know. Um, of course, it falls under, you know, clearly falls under fashion. Uh, this picture I, I, I love because it, it's, for me, a perfect combination of a guy who was a graphic designer and who went to film school. So the, there was just a, a heavy storm that had just blown through. So it was torrential rain and, uh, and the clouds are, had passing over us. And uh, I saw her waiting, the, the girl waiting to do the shot. And uh, I just saw this shot, you know, and, and then uh, I was just planning on using one guy, but then there was just something nice uh, that I incorporated two other models that I had, and, and this idea of trying to put some mystery into the shot, trying to tell a story in the shot, and it, once again, it's just a rectangle, but it's uh, what, you, what you can put into it. And uh, so therefore, the shot has emotion to it, and it... Uh, at the same time, you don't quite know what's absolutely going on, you know, but uh, graphically it's strong and it feels a bit like a film still, which uh, I liked. This was another complicated shooting. It was at the time that uh, it was actually suggested by Spike Lee 
and he suggested it to the Face magazine in London uh, that we did a story on uh, Malcolm X. And uh, this was another story that I prepared to do different, different scenarios. And uh, I had a couple of actors come in and play policemen. And uh, I had these, these guys. So I, I was telling the story of, of just the, the look of Malcolm X. And it was for a fashion shoot. It was Paul Smith suits. Uh, and the suits are kind of copied from 1960s suits. Um, so, um, you know, when you prepare something like this, you, you actually get the... It, it, it just makes your life easier. Um, the, the guy on the right there who's shouting was my assistant, actually. Um, and the two other guys were actors that I used. And uh, if you know the story of Malcolm X, Farrakhan uh, was the big opposer of Malcolm X. And people said he, it was suspicious that he might have had something to do with the assassination or not. And uh, so this, this assistant of mine looked like Farrakhan. And in fact, I, I did a, a, a cover of, uh, I think it was either Newsweek or Time, but I went and I photographed Farrakhan in, in his house in Chicago. So it was kind of, for me, it was very interesting. And, uh, but the, the way this shot came around, I was going to do a portrait of these two guys. And on the, the, the TV in the Winnebago, the, the driver was watching uh, an old movie. And in the middle of the movie, just as I was about to go and do this shot, there was, in the movie, somebody just shouted at another guy. It was a, kind of a film noir. And, and he kind of raised his fist to, to hit this, and he was screaming at the guy. And I, I, I thought, that's, that's what this shot needs. It needs a confrontational, not just people there. And so I, I got my assistant into a suit. And, uh, and it was therefore, at that point, you, you get a powerful shot, you know? So when you do a shooting, you, you never get the day back. You know, if you, if, if you shoot on the February the 8th, you never get that day back. It's gone, you know? So you, you want to make sure that you get something out of it. So you should remain switched on at all times. You should never be laid back. You should be wired, you know? Um, when I'm shooting, I have a lot of adrenaline. I don't, I sometimes have a coffee, but I don't really need it because the, the, the adrenaline for the shooting is enough for me, you know? Uh, so uh, that's where that shot came from. So it's just, I saw something in a, in, in a screen, stole it and, and used it. So uh, it, it's just being aware, you know? This was done at the Olympic Stadium in, uh, in Berlin and was uh, a, a shot for Comme des Garçons and was a, the important element for me was this kind of wrinkly collar and, and it had a white button and a black shirt. So uh, it's, it's, once again, it's just pure graphics there. Uh, of the shot, you know. Uh, this was done in Naples, and it was for, done for Stern magazine. The, at that time, had very good uh, editors working for it. And the, the idea for the shooting was that we would do the same dress in every shot, which was pretty unusual. Like, th th there was only really one dress in the whole shooting. And the, the, the idea behind it, and this was a good idea that I came up with, with an editor. We did it, as I said, in Naples. And I used to, to love in Naples, the time I'd been there, where you see the, the, you see the women going to work and they are fully made up. I mean, they have false eyelashes, they have cheekbones, they have glamorous dresses. You would think they're going to a dance or something, but they're actually just going to work. Uh, so the women of Naples really make an effort, you know. Uh, to, to kind of dress up. And, and so that was the basic idea for this, you know. And um, it's a simple kind of kissing shot. Uh, but it's, you know, how do you make a simple kissing shot kind of powerful like this, you know? I mean, I think for wedding photographers that are here, I, I think you, if you could get a shot like this, I... I, I, to, I, I think to get passion and, and power is, is you know, I'm, as I said, I'm not the, as I made it clear early on, I'm not a wedding photographer <laughs> or a successful one. Um, 
This was a girl called Charlotte, and this was for Italian Vogue, and uh, she had a fabulous ability. She had, she had blue eyes, but she had this amazing ability. This was done in the desert southwest in the wintertime, and uh, she had this ability that she would just relax her face and then just quickly just open the, her eyes and look straight at the sun. She could just, and not many people, because most people, their reaction is that they screw up their face right away. So the, she was great to work with because of this, because then you were able to hit the light earlier than with most people. You're not waiting for golden hour, but you, you, get, you can get this power into, into a shot with the shadows and so on. So this is just 100% natural sunlight, you know. Um, here again, I, I've often used this idea of the silhouette, um, you know, where you, you can get mystery. And it's the same girl as you just saw, uh, also done. And I, I went to a market on the day I arrived there, and I found these old sombreros. Uh, which was not part of the editor's plan, but it's how you can, how can you contribute to the shooting? How can you make the shooting better? How can you, what do you bring to the shooting? You don't just turn up and say, what am I shooting? You, so the, obviously that shot would still be not a bad shot uh, if you took away the sombrero, but the sombrero is doing a lot of the work and it's creating the mystery and the shadow and so on. And there's, of course, no attempt to light her face there. This is just raw sunlight in the middle of the day. Uh, this is a very early shot of the model, Christy Turlington, who's a fabulous person, fabulous model. And, uh, you know, I, I was doing the shot of her just sitting on the donkey, and I'd done lots of donkey shots before. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the idea is how do you, you make a statement that you're in Egypt and how do you make the shot just a little bit more unusual? And uh, then I asked her if she could balance, and of course she was game for anything. You know, this shot's about 30 years old, so she was early on in her career. Uh, and uh, so it was just a way of, of and I, in, in my camera kit, I have a little whistle, a sharp one actually, not, a little, not so little, but, and uh, it, it comes in handy when you're photographing dogs and animals. <laughs> And uh, so I just took out the whistle and, and hit the whistle. And of course, the donkey's ears just popped up like that. So that, that, that's, how, that's how that was done. Um, this shot was lucky. It's obviously in Paris, uh, the, the Art de Triomphe, and a uh, fabulous model called Lisa Kaufman, a Canadian model. And uh, she was, I was photographing them kind of basically semi-nude in a, in a bedroom. And she asked if she could nip outside for a, a cigarette on the balcony of the hotel. And uh, so I, I went out to get her because I was ready for the next shot. And I just saw her there looking over, you know, having, having her cigarette. And of course, it, it made a good shot. I had a small little portable strobe there. Uh, it's balanced out the shot. Uh, um, I had enough depth to actually, if I wanted to get the, the, the Ardutrium sharp as well as her, and, uh, but I, it just was going to be better if you just took some of the visual energy out of the, the arch itself and uh, that it focused on her, you know, the, the, the energies on her and, and the mood of her, you know. Uh, sometimes with fashion photographers, uh, they're very intent on how the lighting is on the girl, how the girl kind of looks, uh, but sometimes there's a slight weakness, and I, I, you can direct this to, to myself also, uh, that sometimes there's a a weakness in how you handle the model's expression. And models are not actresses, but if you begin to work a little bit with a model, you can sometimes get an emotion out of, you know, basically out of, uh, out of a model. You, you, you can make the shot stronger. Uh, I used to work with a very good makeup artist uh, called Michelle Wojcicki. She was wonderful. And, uh, and, and she would go out early in the morning and she would find me things to photograph that was just perfect. So it was a very nice thing. And she, this morning she found this kind of what looks like an orchid. It was done in the Caribbean and the, the St. John's, the Virgin Islands. 
and uh, it, it was such a, a, a beautiful shape. So uh, I was then at that point incorporating in Italian Vogue images like this with the fashion because it just added to the story. It made the story richer and, and made it a more powerful uh, story, you know. i done a lot of portraits that I, I, I love photographing two women uh, together, you know, heads together. So I've done uh, a lot of that. And uh, this was done in the south of England in a, uh, in a famous house called Charleston Farmhouse. And it's where the Bloomsbury group uh, hung out and did a lot of their painting and their writing. And uh, they were a famous 1920s, 30s group of people. And I photographed in the, this farmhouse before it was a museum. Now it's a museum and difficult to get into, in fact. Uh, but uh, the inspiration for this was Bloomsbury Group, so it had a 1930s look to it. Also the same. And uh, the, the funny thing in, in this shot, uh, you, you can see that behind there, it's a, a Virginia Woolf picture there on, on, on the, and uh, Vanessa Bell and uh, uh, interesting people. And uh, the, the girl I was photographing there was the same girl I was talking about earlier, Charlotte, who could look into the sun, you know. And, uh, and it was a funny thing happened that she came and, and I, I, I said to the editor, I said, this is another shot in Charlotte. I said, aren't we doing too many shots on her? And uh, she took the she was holding flowers that I'd given her, and she put the flowers in front of the face. And of course, that, that, I just noticed that she did it. She did it very quickly like that when I was complaining there were too many shots of her. And she put it in front of her face. So, you, you know, you can, you can find that. This is Couture, Studio Couture, is Italian Vogue again, uh, shot in Paris. And uh, of course, here, you're, it's a very good model, Kirsten Owen, fabulous model, who's still working. Uh, this shot's about 30 years old. Um, you know, sometimes when you shoot things well, photographically well, with weight and power, uh, shot in a four by five piece of film, uh, the, shots can, the shots can hold their own as time goes on. So you're, you're looking at something that's, as I said, is 30 years old. So you can, uh, when you shoot with strength and power, and determination, even if a simple shot like that with fairly simple lighting, uh, the, the, the shots 30 years later, can, you can still show them. It's not that you have to hide them away. You know. uh, this was also done in Paris. It's uh, uh, Vivian Westwood tights. It was done in the Comédie Française. Uh, great location backstage at, at a theater. And uh, I forget, what's her name again? Erin, you would remember. Gabrielle Reese. She was uh, uh, in the U.S. Olympic volleyball team <laughs> uh, and, and also did modeling. This is a shot of Naomi Campbell. Uh, it's the same technique as you saw earlier, almost uh, the shadow on the face, the silhouette. And in fact, because this was in Palm Springs, it was very hot. Uh, it was one of the first shots I did like this. And what I had done was I, I put a flag there because it was so hot. On, on her, the, the sun, that I wanted to just set up the camera, and I put it there, and in fact, I did the first shot, the Polaroid, uh, with, with the flag in position, just to make sure the composition was good, and uh, uh, I, I noticed the silhouette, and, and, and so I kept the shot that way, you know. It was, um, one thing, just to speak about, just very briefly, um, during the 70s, I was a handheld photographer, I only did did handheld. And since the 80s, I'm 99.9% on, uh, on a tripod. I tend to find a shot and then nail it down. And uh, the reason I, I like that is uh, I love it that I have a visual contact with the model. That it's not this idea that the camera comes up here and you take the picture like this. I love it that the camera's here. I already know what's happening in the frame, in the rectangle, and uh, I know that the, the, it's solid, the picture, and uh, that way I'm communicating with the model, you know. 
This is Italian couture. Uh, tremendous. Uh, for, uh, it was uh, Ferré, it was the Gianfranco Ferré uh, outfit. Um, here was a shot I did in Morocco. It actually happened to be the same girl uh, where Italian Vogue asked me to photograph the bracelets. And uh, so I, I did these shots where it was on four by five film and it was very easy to double expose, just hit the camera twice. And it gave it just a little bit more energy and movement. So the shots are sharp, but sometimes the bird moved and the cage, because of the repeat of the, the wires of the cage, it made the shot more interesting. And uh, the graphics were, were, were interesting. Uh, so uh, this shot here I, I got into trouble with because they'd, they'd flown this model especially all the way from New York to, to London and she was a very big model and uh, I'd gone into this room that was in an art college, my old art college, and uh, there was that piece of black fabric was just hanging there and I, uh, I, I just knew with this Yuji Yamamoto uh, outfit, I just knew that that was a, a good shot and of course not only was the model furious, so was the editor, but uh, the, the next shot, I, I, I got something from her. This is uh, Isimiyaki. See, once again, these are graphics again and again and again and again, you know? Um, four by five. Um, and one thing you would know, and I, I know that you all understand digital very well, and when you, when you downsize things, it was one of the hardest things for me when I first made presentations. I was used to showing, you know, big slides and, and a lot of the images soften, but the beauty of a of, of presentation is that you can, you can of course get through tons and tons of material. You know, you know, you show lots of images and so on. Uh, this is a uh, Christy Turlington, and uh, the light, the you know, the light I used was about the size of this thing here almost. Uh, it was a tiny little light source, and uh, when you do that, you have to be very precise about how, where you put the model and you put the light because there's there's no softening of the images. Of the, of the image, you know, there's no, no fill or anything. It's to do with the black silhouette and, and the, the face, you know. Christy, unfortunately, hates this shot because of the smoke, and she's now a big non-smoker, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I said to her, time is, the amazing thing about photography is it freezes time, and that's, you know, at that time you smoke, so. Uh, here's another double headshot. That's Gabrielle Reese and uh, a girl called Michaela Bercou. Uh, Vivian Westwood sent me this shoe to, and asked if I could do a shot of it, you know, which is kind of a monumental object. And uh, I do love still life. And I, I'm always happy that if I have a week in front of me that's just still life, I'm always happy. But then when I get to the end of the week, I've had enough of it. You know, I, I can't, you know, I can't do any more. Once again, raw sunlight. Jose Toledo is a model. She's a big personality now in Spain. She has her own TV show. Uh, there's a guy I found in Vegas, did a, a shot of him. This was a kind of religious theme that was during the Scorsese film, Last Temptation, and, and I had a really good set designer make, make the stuff for this. Uh, he was a, a, a set art director, and he made all of these beautiful things for me, you know? Uh, it was great. Italian Vogue, we can go through quickly, because I want, I want to get to, still, that, that's for Italian Vogue jewelry. Very old shot from the 70s. Uh, this was done in the, the, the Cairo Museum and uh, is the glove of Tutankhamun. And I did all of these artifacts. It took two and a half years to get into the museum to get permission to photograph these objects. And it was not easy at all. Uh, and uh, I had a very limited amount of time and I waited. I got there to do it on the day they told me to be there and they said you can't do it for another week. So I had to wait in Egypt, cancel a shooting. It was a nightmare. Uh, but uh, it, it was wonderful to do. In other words, it's not the photograph. It's the idea of doing the object. So it's not, any photographer in this room could do this picture. Um, but then I would then argue that any photographer in this room didn't do it. Hi. Uh, can you talk about the famous uh, Hitchcock picture? Uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty early on in my career, and I got uh, a call from... Uh, Harper's Bazaar magazine, so I was very excited. I was still in LA at that time, and I thought, oh my God, Harper's Bazaar magazine. And um, they said, we'd like you to photograph somebody famous, and I said, who's, 
they said, we'll let you know tomorrow. So the next day they called and said, uh, Hitchcock, it's for the Christmas issue. He's giving his recipe on how to cook a goose. Uh, and uh, he's, he's, he's a gourmet chef, and he has a recipe. And uh, we want you holding a plate. We want him holding a plate, you know, with the goose on it. So I, I thought about it overnight. I thought, what the hell? And I, I called him back, and I said, isn't it funny that we get a plucked goose, and he strangles it himself? Um, and uh, fortunately for me, the editor loved the idea, and I put some Christmas decorations around the goose's neck. And uh, I, I was very nervous. I mean, obviously, it was Hitchcock, and I was just out of film school. So I, I was really concerned, you know, uh, about the shooting. And uh, I thought, I'll just do it in a simple way. Uh, and my real contribution was that it wasn't him holding a plate, because I, I thought he was going to look like a maitre d', you know, holding this plate, you know. And uh, I thought it was more fun like this. And uh, the, the shot was tremendously successful worldwide for me. Uh, it, 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 it really, I, after that I was booked, you know, by New York magazines all the time after I did this, this shot. But it was really the first famous person I'd ever photographed. So it, it, was, it was a lucky, it was a lucky shot. Um, but I, I was nervous, but he helped me, so. Have you ever shot an image and after it was shot, you looked at it and you were totally impressed with it and you couldn't believe what you're walking away with? And if so, which image would that be? Um, I think early on as a photographer, it was actually the opposite to that. <laughs> and uh, in, in fact, I would do a shot on a Monday and I would think, wow, this is the, the Sistine Chapel of photography. You know, this is some, uh, amazing. This is incredible. This is uh, outrageous. And then on Tuesday when the film came in, I thought, oh, it's not as good as I remembered it yesterday. And then on Wednesday, I threw it out. So I went from the Sistine Chapel, two days later, I threw it out. So this was one of the things that I realized, that there was a, a technical shortcoming. When I say that technical things are important, not important. But I realized that it was time for me really to knuckle down and learn how to, to, to be a photographer, really to, to experiment with lighting, to, to do homework, to, to sweat like a dog, you know. Um, which I loved because, you know, which you know now from hearing me that, uh, uh, the, the bad news is photographers never retire. Uh, the good news is photographers never retire. You just keep on going, you know. I've got lots of people, friends of mine my age, that have been retired in Florida for 10 years, you know. I, I just keep on going. Next week I'm in Moscow. The week after that I'm in Amsterdam. Then I fly from Amsterdam to Kyoto, uh, all for shows. And, um, you know, there was a, we were going to try and fit in the whole Pirelli calendar thing here, but there was just not time. Uh, and, and then later this year I have a show in Berlin. So I'm shooting all the time. I'm, I'll be shooting in Japan. I'm shooting here. Uh, and that, that's the good news. But it's, I think I was pleased with the Hitchcock to ask a shot. That, uh, I, I, I was so happy the next day there was something on the film. That was brilliant. You know, so I mean, I, mean, I, I, I thought, wow, and I, I, I bet... I think they'll like this shot, you know. So I, I felt almost so good about it that I felt that, uh, that, 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 it was, that I'd done a good job on it, you know, even though I was super nervous. And I was lucky it was him because he was helping me. I've traveled to uh, third world countries often, and um, I like to take pictures of, you know, locals. And I, I'd like to know how you handle the situations when you shoot someone who's a stranger in a third world or another country, and you're, you're using that for profit. Do you pay them? Um, what is it, your ethical sort of uh, way of thinking about that? Right. Thank you. Um, that particular shoot actually was for the, you know, the one in Benin, for example, and then there's other ones like in Morocco. Um, I found that I used a guide and I would just simply point to somebody, can we take the picture? And I would say as much as nine out of ten people said yes. And we would give them, you know, maybe a couple of dollars equivalent. Because that's, to be quite honest with you, that's, unless it was something truly amazing, exceptional, then if they, if they wanted to do it, and a lot of times I would have a Polaroid camera and I would do a Polaroid. Uh, I, I would do a, a Polaroid and give them the Polaroid so they, they had a, 
they had a Polaroid. In fact, in fact I, I must tell a very quickly here a very <laughs> funny story that, uh, to let you know how long I've been a photographer, that uh, I had an assistant of mine, a guy, a guy called Troy Word, he was a wonderful guy. And um, he began telling me the story that he went to, to, to Africa, to Senegal. And uh, he said he, he traveled into the wilds of, of Africa um, in, a, in this Jeep. And uh, they kept getting deeper and deeper. And they ended up sleeping overnight in their Jeep. And they just kept on going further and further and further until it became, he said, very primitive, like really primitive African villages in the middle of nowhere, near, near the border with Mali and so on. And uh, so he thought, my God, they've never seen a white man before. You know, so he, so he said, so they, <laughs> he then went into this village and uh, somebody that uh, he, he there was, he found one person that spoke a tiny amount of English, and he said, well, if you want to photograph here, you have to ask the chief of the, the, the village. And uh, so he said, that, that's fine. So he met the chief, and uh, the chief granted him permission to, to photograph in the village. And, uh, and so Troy said, well, that, that, that's great, I'm so excited about that. And he began photographing them, and he said, they've never seen a camera before. Um, and uh, he, he said, really, yeah. he, he was super excited about it. And then at the end of his, his shooting, which was two or three hours, um, the, the, chief, the chief invited him to have a tea with him uh, in, his, in his hut. And uh, he, he took Troy in there and handed him a tea. And then he took him over to the wall in the hut. And there was a faded Polaroid of me with the chief. <laughs> so so, so he, he, I, I, to be honest with you, I didn't know what he was telling, where the story was going, because I'd forgotten this incident, you know. And, uh, and this was 24 years before he was there. And, uh, and it was just me standing next to the, the chief, and the chief had kept this faded Polaroid on the, on, on the wall, you know. But I, I think it's a little bit like when you, you ask Kate Moss, is she going to be nude? You ask, and if the answer is no, that's the end of the discussion. It's her right to say yes or no. And uh, so I think in all these countries, you ask. Um, I, I'm never just brazen about it. Uh, I'm usually asking if I can do portraits, or sometimes I'm, I'm sh shooting by hand. When I say I, on tripod, but sometimes I'm doing reportage and I'm shooting by hand. Uh, you know. So uh, I, I think politeness is the, and respect is the is the, the dominant words that you should keep in mind for that. I, I never force the situation at all. If somebody doesn't want to be photographed, then I don't go there. Yeah, I've admired your work for decades. Oh um, my God, that makes me feel I, very I'm old. impressed, uh, we're all impressed that um, every photograph you take is a new, unique view. What I'm wondering is, since you've started, is there a unifying thread? Or is it that every photograph is a new way of well, looking? I, I, I think it's what I really laid out at the very beginning. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's graphics and film. And if you look at them, you, like there's the shot of Steve Jobs. It, it's pure graphics, that shot. And if you go back 40 years and you look at the Hitchcock, it's, you, you, you could slightly argue that it's the same shot. In other words, you, you, theoretically, if you could do a time machine, you could put in Steve Jobs, take him away, and then put in Hitchcock. So I think there's a, a simplicity and, and a graphics there, but it's a love of film and composition, and it's also a, a great love of, of light that I, I, I've always had, from strobe lighting to, to tungsten to mixing everything to daylight to... Uh, trying to be a master of all of that. And as I said early on, I found, I, I find the technical things d annoying and disturbing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, a, a lot of, particularly men, women are not as guilty of this, they get sucked into uh, photography because of the equipment. 
And uh, lots of times I have meetings with photographers and all they want to talk about is equipment. Have I seen the latest Sony lens or a phase one and this and have you got that and you, you know, I prefer film or you know, do you prefer digital? They want to talk about that rather than the, 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 the soul of a picture, of what your, the picture should be, you know, uh, and, and preparation for that. So I think that the equipment is of course important. If you don't have a camera and a camera doesn't work, then you're not getting a picture. So of course it's important and you should be aware of what's going on, but that, that should be a given. And let's say one day a week, you give all your attention to that, but the other six days of the week, and it should be a seven day week if you're a real photographer, uh, the other six days of the week, you should be planning, thinking about shootings. What am I gonna shoot? What am I gonna shoot? What am I gonna shoot? And, and what am I putting together? What can I do to, to put together a better portfolio, more memorable, more powerful, more, more interesting, more unusual, more strange, you know? What can I do to make it better, you know? And, and you, nowadays you're lucky because when I was starting out, there, there wasn't this thing called the internet where you could just simply type in Cartier-Bresson and up comes 300 pictures of Cartier-Bresson, Ansel Adams, that you, Richard Avedon, you type that in and you've got them all at your fingertips. You had to go out and find a book and then afford to buy a book on Irving Penn before you could research it, you know? Uh, so. I have one last question for you. Sure. Is, is it true that better photographers wear reversed black slouch hats? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Albert Watson. Thank you.